Hello, I'm Nurbek Savitahunov. You're watching news from Kazakhstan. These are the headlines. Earthquake response exercises conducted in Almaty. The signal attention all was given via sirens, radio, television, and text messaging services. President of Tajikistan orders an end to special operations in the city of Khorog. The Ministry of Internal Affairs denies information regarding deaths among the civilian population, while the media mentions and cites various data. Border guard Vladislav Chilak renounces his confession. His relatives claim the soldier gave it under pressure. Border guard Vladislav Chilak renounced his previous testimony where he confessed to murdering 14 of his fellow soldiers and a huntsman in May this year at the Arkhankirgan outpost. The soldier also declined services of his public defender. He now has two attorneys, and since their appearance, Chilak's attitude towards the incident underwent cardinal changes. His grandfather Vladimir contends the soldier is calm and sure of himself. In the meantime, the military prosecutor's office knows nothing of the new turn in the investigation and refrains from comments. Vladislav Chelek denies all testimonies he had given previously. Only after the forensic psychiatric expert examination was completed, two attorneys were allowed to defend Vladislav. However, he refused from public attorney. Later, the accused of murdering 15 people and setting the border post Arkan Kirgen on fire told the lawyers Birli Khajanov and Sarsyanov that his earlier testimonies were made under pressure. In return for his confession, he was promised to escape life imprisonment. <laughs> He was threatened that they would get to him in the temporary detention center if he did not cooperate and testify. In return for his confession, they offered to ease his sentence. But now he denies his prior testimonies after having consulted our lawyers. Lawyers say they have not yet familiarized themselves with the materials of the case. They need to thoroughly study each and every episode. The defending lawyers intend to appeal the trial requesting to carry out investigation and expert reviews. Besides, the investigation officers need to provide them with the results of the forensic psychiatric expert examination. Chelov told that the border post came under attack. He managed to escape. Later during investigation, he was put under mental pressure. During the four-hour talk, new details came to surface. Allegedly, another border guard, Kambar Aganas, ran away with Vladislav Chelak from the border post. He was supposed to have escaped the fire. The soldier Aganas, who was on the watch that day, heard the shots being fired in the vicinity of the barracks. He said that they were under attack and they ran together with Vladislav. Later, Aganas fell behind and Vladislav had not seen him ever since. The soldier in question is listed in Arkan Kirgen records. He was enrolled from Aktubinsk region and was about to celebrate his 21st birthday. However, his father Askar Sarinov reported to journalists that he ID'd his son during the expert examination in Astana. His body was less subjected to burns. The military prosecution office refrains from commenting the defendant's meeting with his attorneys and its unexpected turn. It is still unknown whether the attorneys will file a suit against the investigation officers for tempering the evidence and testimonies. According to international regulations, mental press Russia is equivalent to torches. Meanwhile, the three Arkhan Kirgen border guards' fate remains unknown. They are Denis Ray, Rustem Akhlbekov, and Mir Khaniminov. On July 27th, the memorial plague will be installed in the memory of soldiers who died on May 27th at the Arkhan Kirgen border checkpost. The relatives of soldiers will also be there. Unfortunately, the journalists will not be allowed around the monument this day. To recall, the results of forensic examination have not yet made public, and not all families were able to receive the remains of the border guards. The border guard Chelak's statements of pressure and threats during the investigation once again prove that tortures are common for Kazakhstan. Recently, the UN's Committee Against Tortures has for the first time in history ruled against the Republic. Representatives of the world community have criticized the country for police outrage. Alexander Gerasimov, Kostanai city resident, survived by a miracle after law enforcement tortures. In 2007, he was accused of murdering his neighbor. The police tried to beat the confession statements out of him. Alexander became handicapped after the tortures. After that, five years of Lengthy lawsuits followed, and they only aggravated his health. Following the prosecutor's office expert examination, he was transferred to a mental institution. The UN's committee has revealed blatant violations in the case and reminded Kazakhstan that it is a member of the Convention Against Tortures. The world community demands to investigate the case and find those responsible. 
In related news, Freedom House Fund President David Kramer includes Kazakhstan in a category of non-free states. On Wednesday, he met with journalists in Almaty and answered questions on the topic of human rights and democratic norms. Freedom House monitors all the incidents that take place within the territory of the Republic. At the same time, it notes that there are virtually no improvements in the judicial system and anti-corruption measures. The media continues to suffer from legal restrictions. Independent journalists are persecuted and undergo attacks. Most of the publications are either owned by the state or by members of the presidential family. According to Kramer, Kazakhstan is one of the few OSCE member states where there is no law on freedom of information. We also produce a second report called Freedom of the Press. Here too, unfortunately, Kazakhstan was ranked in the not free category. And we are prepared to have dialogue with government officials, and I'll be flying to Astana later today in the hope of trying to create more space for journalists. But on the other hand, civil society received a higher rating because of the incidents that took place in Zhanaozian in December 2011. Freedom House is collecting data on the investigation of the tragedy. International experts are also concerned about the fate of the politician Vladimir Kozlov. On July 26 in Almaty, David Kramer will hold a meeting with the representatives of state agencies during which he will discuss these questions. The government of Kazakhstan has been interested in having only UN experts in the investigation of events in Zhanaozian. The question should be addressed to these experts who should tell why they did not take part in the investigation. The participation of the UN experts in the investigation of events in Zhanaozian is not proved. In other news, activist Vadim Kuramshin's lawyers cannot confirm the information regarding their client's hunger strike. As Raisa Nurmasha was said over the phone, she was aware of Kuramshin's warning to the judge, but she does not know whether he began the strike or not. The activists plan to go to these extreme measures as a sign of protest that expertise results still haven't arrived from Mastana. He also demands to return the jury for trial and to prosecute the investigator Aliyev for manipulating documents. It was reported earlier that the arrested on suspicion of extortion Vadim Kuramshin announced a hunger strike in Itara's detention ward on Monday. I was there on July 18th and came back from there only on July 19th. Since then, even 10 days have not passed, so I don't know where these rumors about his hunger strike come from. I guess this question should be addressed to the staff of the detention center. Relatives and attorneys of those convicted of organizing a terrorist group in Taraz are awaiting the appeal court's decision. After the court found the defendants guilty, they filed an application to appeal the sentence. The response is expected in early August, although there are few hopes of a full acquittal. The court will be held behind closed doors, and the defendants will be represented by public lawyers. It is noteworthy that those convicted haven't been allowed to see their families for eight months. The court didn't give us even an hour for a visit. We are now waiting for the appeal results. They told us they would give us a day once it is granted, but I still don't know whether a visit will be allowed or not. The completion of the investigation is expected in the west of Kazakhstan. The policeman Timirbek Zhaksilbaev was murdered on June 21st on the outskirts of October. Later, the media reported about explosions and hostages. However, General Prosecutor's Office later denied this information and pointed to the assaulters. During the course of the investigation, two criminals were killed and one was wounded. He is currently in the pre-trial detention facility. We managed to contact his lawyer by phone. He said that he had not read the case file yet. In international news, Kazakhstan provided humanitarian aid to Tajikistan. As the foreign ministry explains, the official transfer took place on July 24th in Dushanbe in connection with Imam Ali Rahman's appeal to Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. The ministry notes that this isn't the first aid to the Tajik side, saying that in the last six years, a monetary equivalent of $25 million was given to Tajikistan. <laughs> Humanitarian assistance consists of four vans with aid. The two vans are filled with premium flour and two other vans packed with vegetable oil bottles. The special operation in the Tajik city of Khorog is complete. As reported by the agency Asia Plus, chairman of the Gorno Badakhshan Autonomous Region, Kodir Kosimov, met with the mayor of the city where President Imam Ali Rahman's decision of a complete ceasefire was announced. In the meantime, the Republic's Interior Ministry denied the information on civilian casualties on Wednesday. According to the police, 12 government soldiers were killed and 23 were wounded in the raid in Pamir. 
During the Special Forces raid, 30 members of an alleged criminal group were murdered, 40 people, including eight Afghan citizens, were arrested. Earlier, it was reported that at least 200 people were murdered in Harok. Half of them were civilians. According to Tajik Radio Svoboda, some people, including children, were shot dead from sniper rifles. The data on the murder and injured is still contradicting. According to Asia Plus, a special commission is due to count the exact number of casualties among the civilian population in the region. At the order of the president of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, Afghan military were sent to the border with Tajikistan. This information was officially confirmed yesterday. To recap, a special forces raid in Harok began at 4 a.m. local time on Tuesday. Government troops were brought into the region to neutralize the alleged murderers of Abdullah Nazarov, a high-ranking officer of the State Committee of the National Security. As reported by the Tajik Democratic Opposition, the information on the liquidation of the leaders of Gorno Badakhshan is not true. Iqbal Shoh Mubarak Shoyev, leader of the regional organization of the Democratic Party of Tajikistan, stated in his interview to our channel that public leaders of Gorno Badakhshan are not yet ready to enter talks with the Dushanbe regime, and expressed hopes that Russian authorities will, will agree to serve as a mediator in the negotiations. He also refuted accusations of Pamir representatives in separatism and called for the unification of all democratic forces of Tajikistan. Around 1,000 people live in my district. Around 30,000 live in Harok, Tajikistan. Imagine five people died in my district. It will make around 150 casualties in the city. There will be no direct negotiations, only through the middleman. Is it true that you have absolutely no trust to the current government headed by Rahmon and Dushanbe? How can I talk about trust after what had happened? Russia has more than enough influence on our government. They can participate in negotiations and see with their own eyes what had happened and what tragic consequences it brought. The recent military operation in Tajikistan is an attempt to take control of drug trafficking by the ruling elite, says political expert Rasul Jumali. According to him, this was the primary factor for the start of military actions in Gorno Badakhshan. Besides the internal political struggle for power in Tajikistan, I also agree with the opinion of those experts who believe that this conflict is partially due to competition for drug trafficking channels that go through Tajikistan. The local residents gathered for the rally to demand a peaceful settlement of the conflict in Khorgo, the day before the operation of the law enforcement agencies. About 300 people gathered in the regional capital of Gorno Badakhshan region that day. On these fragments of the video which we received from Tajikistan, it is possible to see how the rally went before the troops entered the city. Later, the immigrants from Pamir in Moscow gathered for the rally with the demand to stop the operation of special forces. In addition, another rally was held in front of the Tajikistan embassy in Kyrgyzstan. The expert on Central Asian states Arkady Dubnov believes the current situation could lead to civil war in the future and obviously lower the credibility of the incumbent president, Imam Ali Rahman. The current military operation might possibly lead to temporary establishment of control over rebellious Pamir, but it might become a Pyrrhic victory, the actual resumption of civil war, full-scale episode of which we could witness on July 24th in Khorog. Moreover, this will not bring any respect and trust to official Dushanbe, and most likely it might accelerate the fall of Imam Ali Rahman's regime in its current form. Social Democrat Pyotr Svoik caused a storm of comments after he expressed his views on language in one, the, in one of the social networks. Member of the NSDP believes that, in fact, the state language of Kazakhstan is Russian. This very opinion raised a wave of discontent, especially by national patriots. Meanwhile, political, political experts claim that this way Pyotr Svoik is trying to remove the pro-Kazakh language activists from the upcoming National Council, including the leader of NSDP, Jarmakhan Tuyagbay. The next report has more. Over 40 comments and several messages calling for deport. The opinion of the politician Piotr Svoyak on language policy in the country stayed quite the reaction on Kaznet. The reality is such that the official language in Kazakhstan is Russian. Part of it is due to Russian-speaking elite of Kazakhstan. Sooner or later, in same respect, the Kazakh language might have to become the second official language after the Russian, the language of international communication through school education, incentives and requirements for bilingual candidates for MPs, ministers and heads of agencies. This is the only way to raise the status of the Kazakh language to the second official language. 
The online discussion continued offline. The political expert Aito Sarim believes that the controversial comment has made intentionally posted on the social networking website. I assume that Svoy, guided by personal dislike, decided to cut off the Kazakh segments and Kazakh national organizations in advance in order to hold the event in a different format, perhaps because it is obvious that after such statements, no self-respecting Kazakh patriot will participate in this event. The author of the Facebook message himself, Petr Svoyak, explains that he only expressed his own opinion. It doesn't reflect on the policies of NSDP Azad. His sensational statement is only a bit of the recent interview that was never released. The entire conversation was devoted to the language situation in Ukraine. The parallels between Kazakhstan were drawn accidentally and he didn't mean to insult anyone. There was no sense in responding to the comments because the power of disturbance which is raging there is well proportioned to the strength of the arguments I made. No one offered a single objective or addition or any alternatives. Instead, I received curses and even some threats. However, it's perfectly normal in this situation, yet I still believe I had to do it. The idea of the National Council initiated by the leader of the National Social Democratic Party, Jarmakhan Toyakbay, has been around since spring of 2012. At appropriatory meetings, the experts were proposed to define what would the post Nazarbayev Kazakhstan be like. In the meantime, people talked about why the colleagues of Toyakbay, Bulat Abilov and Amirjan Kasanov are not among the organizers. Many have interpreted this as a sign of a split. They say the party is split into two wings, moderate represented by Toyakbay and Abilov Kasanov that prefer street action protests over sessions. Former leader of Green Party, Sirikjan Mambitalin, observes over the situation at the neighboring opposition camp. He's ready to participate in the National Council with his civil government project. Follow those who have more supporters. I helped Toyakbay in spite of my controversial attitude. Yet Bulat's position is very contentious. His leader ambitions are too strong. It is good, but not in this particular situation. Party members have not yet made comments on the split among the leadership of NSDP Azad. Due to the summer vacation period, the leadership took a break. Jarmakhan Toyakbay had only promised that the preparatory work for the National Council will resume in early August. At the same time, there will be meetings with various representatives of civil society, including the National Patriots. Would all the above-mentioned individuals sit together at the same table? Will be revealed in November with a new platform for dialogue. Kazakhstan President Nusultan Nazarbayev admitted that the situation with grain reserves is uneasy. However, last year's reserves could possibly help the situation. This was voiced on Wednesday at a meeting with Prime Minister Karim Masimov. Also, the head of state and premier discussed the preparation for winter in Kazakhstan and Astana in particular. As usual, President has asked to pay special attention to the capital city. <laughs> While we are on vacations, we should not forget about increasing power supply. Last year, we didn't face the problems in power supply and we need to make a thorough inspection to avoid supply failures in the coming winter. I'll instruct Ahmedov to take this issue under control. The residents of Bebitshilik Street in Astana are outraged by the actions of the authorities that led to the cutting of 173 trees and bushes located along the road. They claim that the plants were cut due to corruption exerted by local authorities. Find out more next. How old is this tree? One, two, three, four, five. We can see the mark on the 16th ring, but there are no marks after that. This tree is about 20 to 30 years old, although it is not so big. The residents of Baby Chilik neighborhood have no other option but to observe the stumps. It has been two weeks since the start of full-scale renovation of the street. The city officials are cutting down the aged trees and replacing pipelines, networks and sewage networks. It seems like a normal process since there were even bigger sacrifices made for the improvement of the capital. However, actually this commonly accepted process angered the residents. Especially for Astana, where there is a lack of trees, every bush counts. The emission gases now fill in the apartments through the windows and the temperature outside is higher since the trees used to absorb the heat and the noise. They have cleared the street just for their parking space. The internet became filled with angry comments of users that forced the mayor of Astana to quickly justify his actions. In his blog, Amangalitas Magambetov explained that root system of 173 trees on the Baby Chilik Street endangered the pipelines and networks. Besides, he explains that the street needs major reconstruction to widen it. After the reconstruction, the road will not look stripped. Astana Zilinstroy has already developed a landscaping project for the Baby Chilik Street, which envisaged planting and relocation of 206 trees and bushes. Besides, 4,116 bushes are planned to be planted along the road.
However, the local residents don't believe in these promises. They question the logic of cutting and replacing the trees with the new ones, which may not survive in the new environment. And if they do survive, it is unknown how much time it will take to restore the previous look of trees. Rizat Mahambetova, who trays fruits and vegetables raised in her small garden, feels very sad about it and resents the fact that city administration cannot raise the social benefits for her four children. For instance, this street went through reconstruction just recently and now they are renovating it again. They are just laundering the money from the state budget. My son lives on 9th of May Street, where the city administration had replaced the road curbs last autumn, but now they blocked the street again to install new road curbs. Less than a month ago, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, while flying over the forestry around the city, mentioned about the importance of landscaping. According to his figures, during the last 14 years, 76 hectares of trees were planted around and in Astana. The president emphasized that everyone should keep up with this trend. It is becoming unclear whether it was the head of the state who sounded unconvincingly or it was the city official who didn't pay attention to his words. The whole country should take part in landscaping since it would be our gift to upcoming generations and Mother Nature. These are good deeds of ours. Spokespersons of Leave Housing to the People are celebrating a victory. Pavadar resident Irina Kazakova was able to defend her right to her only house, from which she was previously evicted. The court confirmed her right for property and recognized the auction legal. On Wednesday, the owner returned to her apartment. More details in the next story. You just hold the door tight, Ira, be careful, don't hurt yourself. Today, Irina Kazakova had an opportunity to briefly see her apartment. Last year, the officers of justice, executing the ruling of the court, put this woman on the street. What are you doing? You could break my hands. I said, get off. You didn't buy this. Don't touch me and go away. Several years ago, Irina Kazakova took a consumer loan secured by her only housing. At first, she regularly paid the loan, but then the women started having problems. As a result, the debts were overdue and bankers immediately filed a lawsuit against their client. The apartment was auctioned off, and despite the fact that its owner was trying to prove the unlawfulness of the auction. Later, the court confirmed Irina Kazakova's title to real property for this apartment in Brighton. However, in reality, it turned out practically impossible to move back in her apartment. I cannot enter my apartment without a legal eviction notice for whoever lives in it. I believe it is Raparova or her nephew, or perhaps they rented it out to the tenants. Legally, I still have debts. It takes them three years to execute, so I know that. To establish the fact of unauthorized individuals staying in her apartment, Irina Kazakova called the police. But it turned out that they cannot interfere with the civil law relations. Therefore, they only maintain the order. In this case, the police is present here to protect the public order. The occupancy and eviction issues as part of civil law relations have nothing to do with internal affairs agencies. The activists of Leave Housing to People movement came to support Irina. One of them, Jalaman Nurkenova, whose son Marat has committed the suicide in despair by jumping off the high-rise building. Following this tragedy, Nurkenov's family was provided the rental apartments. Whether the family gets to keep it is yet questionable. Also, it is not clear who's going to be liable for the death of a young man. I've appealed to a number of places for already 14 months. Nobody wants to be responsible. Neither the prosecutor's office, no one wants to be responsible. I plan on starting it all over again. I'm going back to Almaty to the general prosecutor's office to resume all this. Per approximate data, there are about 500 troubled borrowers in Pavlodar region. Three families already face the eviction. In the meantime, Irina Kazakova is the only person so far to regain the shelter. While preparing this report, it became known that the guests left Irina's apartment even without the court paperwork. So now the legal owner shall finally reside in her apartment. Finally, citywide seismic alert trainings were held in Almaty. They informed residents and guests of the city via mass media, loudspeakers and text messages. The training started at 10 a.m. with the signal, Attention All. It was expected that the residents of the city will leave their homes and enter the streets. However, the majority preferred to stay inside their workplaces and homes. More details next. Earthquake exercises took place in Almaty on Wednesday. Rescue services and municipal clinical hospital launched a mobile care center and campgrounds. This would serve as a shelter to those who allegedly lost their homes. While the rescue service worked efficiently, the medics failed the exam. Hearing the sounds of sirens, nurses and doctors slowly began to evacuate the facility, leaving their patients behind. This is only training for future, of course, because the nurses evacuated the premises first in order to save themselves. They left their patients inside the collapsing building. Could you please explain? 
The deputy director of the housekeeping unit failed to provide clear answers. Healthcare personnel were encouraged to take a course of civil defense and to correct their mistakes. However, this forgetfulness was nothing new to the representatives of Ministry of Emergency. The key objective of the demonstrative training was to change the minds of citizens who do not respond to the exercise routine. The attempt included alarm signals by radio, television and in the form of SMS. I visited a number of facilities and saw that people are actually engaged in the exercise. They leave the premises and look for the shelter. Where gradually changing the minds of our citizens as we need to be always prepared for any kind of emergency. This is the key issue here. The earthquake exercises will take place on a regular basis from now on. Many still remember the panic in Almaty during the three-day series of aftershocks in May of 2011. The main problem was the delayed reaction of the services responsible for prediction and notification. Back then, the authorities initiated a trial with the responsible parties. On Wednesday, Emergency Situations Department assured that the citizens have no reason to worry for now. However, according to the observations of the reporters, the people were not especially active during the X-hour. This is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.